Hello and welcome to Asia in Depth. I'm Matt Skiavenza. We're bringing back this podcast because we feel that there's never been a better time to talk about what's going on in Asia. So each week, we'll bring you enlightening conversations with experts and thought leaders who can help us understand the politics, economics, and culture of Asia and beyond. We hope you'll stick with us. In today's episode, we focus on a subject that has increasingly dominated headlines over the last two years, trade. For decades, there was a bipartisan consensus in Washington that economic engagement between the United States and the emerging economies of Asia, especially China, would be mutually beneficial. But in recent years, this consensus has frayed. Politicians as diverse as Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump have argued that previous trade deals greatly damaged the American economy and hurt the American worker. And while President Trump's trade war with China is far from universally popular, even his critics acknowledge that the U.S. must fundamentally rethink its relationship with the world's second largest economy. So, how and why did perceptions about trade change so much? And where is this leading? To help us answer these questions, we talked to Wendy Cutler. She's the vice president of the Asia Society Policy Institute and, before that, she served as a U.S. trade negotiator for four administrations. Cutler recently spoke with Asia Society Executive Vice President Tom Nagorski. So, Wendy Cutler, thank you so much for uh, for being with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. You have worked on uh, in your long career as a trade negotiator, no fewer than about ten major, major trade deals. Uh, they are uh, every one of them long, sometimes grueling. I gather twenty four seven endeavors. So, talk for a moment, if you could, just to get us started. How did you become interested and how did you become passionate? And is there some great backstory to how you became a trade negotiator in the first place? Well, thanks, Tom. You know, trade is an issue that's always been of interest to me. It was something that I studied in in college, and it seemed like a vehicle that really helped take a lot of people out of poverty around the world. And so when I started appreciating the international benefits of trade, but then also began to appreciate what it meant for the United States. I became um, more passionate about trade. And I have to say, I entered the government um, in a, in a, at the Department of Commerce at a relatively young age and was thrust into trade negotiations at a young age, put at the, you know, put at the table um, representing the United States within a few years when I joined the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. And once I could actually sit in that seat representing the United States at that time at the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade in Geneva, um, there was no holding me back. This is what I wanted to do. Wow. That was the color of your parachute. Color of my parachute, yes. So is it safe to say, fair to say, that you also uh, came into that role at a young age at a time when this notion of free trade as a, you know, unalloyed, un- well-understood good thing for the United States and the world was maybe at a high point, right? I mean, we're talking, what, early 90s, mid-90s. You mentioned GATT and the WTO and all this. Um, there was not a whole lot of questioning, at least not in this country, that it was good to have a U.S. trade representative and good to pursue these deals, right? Well, absolutely. And when I look back at the early part of my career, I wish I had valued all the support we were getting at that point because really people weren't questioning the benefits of trade. I mean, the labor movement still had concerns, and we took those concerns seriously. But, for example, from Congress, there was just strong bipartisan support. So it wasn't, you know, a matter of um, should we be going forward with these with these deals. It was more a matter, yes, we should, and how could we make these deals not only beneficial for the United States, but also for our trading partners. So we'll delve into some of the details on all these things in a second, but just to kind of cut all the way to the present in a hurry, right? I mean, you've had this rich life uh, career, really, or the better part of a career devoted to these issues and to the core principle that free trade between nations is fundamentally uh, a good thing uh, for humanity. And now that whole notion seems to be under attack, certainly in some corners, uh, uh, many corners of this country and in other parts of the world. And for you, uh, I mentioned you, you, you'd done about 10 major deals worked on in your life. Um, and two of them, the Korea-U.S. Uh, trade agreement and then the Trans-Pacific Partnership, better known as the TPP, uh, again, big landmark deals with Asia uh, front and center. And President Trump comes to office, and the Trump administration 
very quickly says these are bad deals. TPP, the president said many, many times as a candidate and then as president, worst deal ever, that sort of thing, and pulls out. Now, quite apart from what you think is an academic matter about those decisions, what's it like, given all the blood, sweat, and tears put into it, what's it like just on a personal level to see these things gutted so quickly? Well, on a personal level, it, obviously, it's very difficult to watch any project you've worked on for many, many years to be um, basically eliminated by, you know, by the, with the sign of a pen. But I think more importantly, I, what I felt um, with respect to threats to withdraw from the U.S.-Korea FTA and also the actual withdrawal from the TPP was that as a country, we were going to lose. And I feel somewhat vindicated on, on both fronts because I don't think anyone really understands how difficult a trade negotiation is until they're the ones at the table. Sure. And so when you're not at the table, it's great to say we needed a better deal, our negotiators were incompetent. If I was at the table, I could do this. And I think this administration, like previous ones, have learned that these talks are hard. And the results that you're able to achieve, assuming you're able to reach closure in the negotiations, are going to require a give and take. So when I look at the U.S.-Korea free trade agreement, the president did not ended up not withdrawing from that agreement, right. but he ended up amending that agreement. When I look at those amendments, not that were, different, right? They were pretty modest, and frankly, things that I think um, in any previous president probably would have asked for had um, the, the the agreement, you know, continued um, over the years. And with respect to the TPP. I look at the new NAFTA that was negotiated, and somewhere between 50 and 75 percent of the new NAFTA actually includes language straight out of the TPP. Really? I didn't know so that. in many respects, whether it be digital trade or state-owned enterprises or the environment or labor, the, the, the NAFTA rules, the new NAFTA rules are, um, you know, very close, if not identical, to TPP. In certain areas, they built on the TPP, they improved them. And in certain other areas, yes, they, they took away some of the, P, the TPP benefits and came up with new ways to, to address these issues. But overall, there's a lot of similarity. Hmm. Now, uh, whether you're pro-free trade, pro-TPP or not, uh, fair to say some of this stuff can seem, certainly the layperson like myself, to be pretty arcane. Sometimes we don't get the, the acronyms. There's TPP, there's RCEP, there's CHORUS, there's all these things. But more to the point, some of the issues that you spend all that time working on are not that easy to understand either. But uh, I think you'd be the first, well, let me ask you, in all the, that arcane detail, explain a little bit to the layperson, the general public, some examples of what really matters to them of those things that, you know, you spent all that time with your counterparts at the negotiating table. Um, how does it impact a consumer, business owner, et cetera? Well, trade brings enormous benefits to our, our overall economy, but also to actual families, communities, and individuals. And here, you know, you, you mentioned consumers, for example. Well, as a result of trade, we've seen lower prices, and we've also seen more choice. We Now we can buy vegetables year-round because many of them are imported in the seasons when we don't produce them. Um, and obviously, we've, I think we're all appreciating low consumer prices now that tariffs are being imposed and additional ones are being threatened against China, where the consumer is going to see prices increase um, in the coming months. Um, with respect to, I would just say, exports overall, remember a lot of trade is not only about imports that benefit consumers, but it's also about exports. Sure. The United States is a very innovative, productive country. We, we export loads and loads of agricultural products, manufacturing products, services, ideas, intellectual property. Um, and all of those exports, um, they, go somewhere, they have right? to go somewhere. We can't sell them all domestically. Um, and, and, and when you produce those exports, you're employing people in the United States. So the exports create jobs. And what the statistics show, not only do exports create thousands of jobs um, per you know, a billion dollar, a billion dollars worth of exports, but moreover, most of these jobs are more higher paying jobs than jobs associated with the traditional economy. Um, 
trade also contributes, I mentioned earlier, through the years, it has helped lift people out of poverty around the world. Um, and it has also contributed to economic growth um, and to um, just, you know, overall, um, you know, promotion of innovation um, in economies around the world. Now, that said, I'll be the first to admit those are the benefits. Right. And trade isn't great 100 percent of the time to everyone. And there are people who do not benefit from trade. Um, and I think that in those areas, the United States needs to do a much better job taking care of those people and also promoting policies in the United States that gets our workforce ready for the international marketplace of tomorrow. Right. So um, in preparation for this, Wendy, this conversation, I, I did a little brushing up on, on the history here. Uh, in my case, I needed a lot of brushing up. But so free trade, at least as a doctrine, free trade among sovereign states uh, dates to 16th century imperial Spain, right? Born in ideas about freedom of commerce and freedom of the seas. Uh, then not long after that, it was the two pretty well-known British economists, uh, Adam Smith and David Ricardo, who developed this idea in its modern form. And fundamentally, and you've alluded to this now a couple of times, that they, they believe trade was was the main reason why certain civilizations going a long way back before this was a sort of a, a doctrine in, 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 uh, in, in theory, but uh, ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome, and many Asian powers over the centuries, and I guess China in particular, uh, all saw the benefits, even if they weren't <laughs> you know, uh, negotiating deals uh, uh, under the heading of free trade. And of course, since World War II, the United States uh, has been a big champion um, of the concept. You mentioned NAFTA, the WTO, and until recently, the TPP. So given that, and given all the prosperity that's been realized, Asia, the last few decades, has been extraordinary, what happened? What, I mean, why is free trade um, as a concept, as a doctrine, not just under some review and debate, but it's really fallen into disfavor. Um, why is that? Well, it's an interesting question. I think a lot, a lot root, the, the roots of the question really go back to the world order that and the international institutions like the GATT that were established right after World War II. Let's remember the United States was by far the number one economic power, and our objective was to help bring other countries out of the aftermath of the war and help them grow their economies. And what's a better way to grow your economy than to open up our market so, and, and, and work to op open their market so we could trade? And the idea was that this was going to be a win-win proposition, not only for the United States, but for other countries. And for a while it was, right? And absolutely. But I think what, you know, what has happened is that people are questioning the benefits of trade now because the United States is not the only game in town. And what we've seen over time is many, many other countries, whether it was Japan 20, 30 years ago, China now, really threatening our supremacy in the trade area and a feeling that these countries have not had to really live up and, and adhere to the same obligations that the United States um, lived up to under the GATT and the WTO. And as a result, I think the feeling is that these trade agreements have exacerbated income inequality in countries like the United States, places in Europe, and I think we're going to see this in other advanced um, developed countries. The feeling is that, you know, now a lot of the countries that were once on top of the world are really, um, you know, being disadvantaged by trade. I'm reminded, as you say that, of a couple of things. One being, as a former journalist, I'm... I'm very cognizant of the fact that, that, you know, the negative is sometimes a much easier <laughs> case to make. In, in the media, in print, uh, you mentioned critics of the agreement, you know, the agreements that you worked on so hard. Uh, they have loud voices until they figure out that, that maybe it's not so easy. But uh, in terms of uh, the, the winners and losers in free trade arrangements, uh, the story of how you get hurt is sometimes a bit more compelling, I guess, than how you are helped. Do you think that's been a part of the problem? I mean, I don't, you don't see that many big takeout stories in, in, in the mainstream media, at least, about the great beneficiaries of global free trade, I think. Um, that's a great point, and that has really affected the ability of, of previous administrations to really explain trade that 
people understand when a plan closes and what that means, but it's hard for them to understand that because of trade, prices are cheaper. The benefits are dispersed. The losses are really focused. And the people who are hurt are generally a lot more vocal than the people who are benefiting. And efforts to get exporters and workers who work for exporters for exporting firms to become more vocal and try and explain trade have been underway, but frankly, they're just never as successful and their stories are never as compelling as the people who feel that they have, you know, they've suffered a big loss. Yeah, and that gets me to the other thing that I'm reminded of, and this is more of a political matter, but I can remember uh, talking with some folks here at the Asia Society actually about this issue when um, when Hillary Clinton uh, and Donald Trump were facing off in 2016. And it seemed to be widely known and understood in some circles that Hillary Clinton, as a former Secretary of State, uh, as maybe a matter of public record, that she was a champion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. She certainly was a champion of the ideals that, that undergirded uh, that uh, agreement. And yet, when it came to a moment on the campaign trail, she said it needed improvement, and she, I think she was, she was publicly opposed to it. I mean, that that can't have helped either. It wasn't just Donald Trump, right? I mean, there was bipartisan, <laughs> at least in the two presidential candidates, antipathy and opposition, right? Exactly. Exactly. And I think once Bernie Sanders, you know, came out strongly sure. against trade, she really had no place to go. And as a result, you know, the rallying cry in a lot in, during the campaign was anti-TPP, in my view, was really about concerns about trade, and TPP almost became the poster child for all the bad things about trade, although people weren't really discussing what was in the agreement. That was irrelevant. It was more that trade and trade agreements are not helping us anymore, and in fact, they're undermining you know, our economic objectives, and they're exacerbating these income equalities and leading to job loss. We're going to take a little break here and talk about live webcasts. You may not be aware of this, but Asia Society New York broadcasts most of its programs live for free at asiasociety.org slash live, and we have some good ones coming up. On November 18th, Tant Mint U will discuss the current situation in his native Myanmar, where he has served as an active participant in their economic reform process. And on December 2nd, ABC News Global Affairs correspondent Martha Raditz will join Tom Nagorski in conversation about her remarkable career covering the top stories in international news. If you miss a program, don't worry. You can always visit our YouTube page to watch the complete video, as well as highlights. And be sure to subscribe at youtube.com slash asiasociety. That's youtube.com slash asiasociety. And now, let's go back to Wendy Cutler and Tom Nagorski. So before I want to come to the U.S. and China, because that's the, the uh, certainly the trade story of the moment, but before we do, I take from what you're saying, Wendy, that really a, a recipe for a better case or, or just a better you know, policy beyond the thing itself might have been uh, and might still be in the future, I guess, to your point, taking care of the, the victims or the people who are being hurt a little bit better than, than we have in this country, while also maybe being a bit more imaginative about making clear what the what the positive benefits are for so many Americans. Yes. You know, yes, okay. <laughs> so let's get then to the uh, the heart of the issue uh, uh, and, and the debates at the moment in the, in the trade war that the United States and China are waging. And to, to go to the beginning of that, which isn't that long ago now, uh, because it really dates in its current form, I guess, to the, uh, uh, to the new administration uh, in Washington, um, it all started right because the United States said fundamentally uh, China is not playing fair, whether we're talking about trade or currency issues or, or other things. Can you just give us like a little 101 on how this started? Well, first, it didn't really start with Trump. Right. I think there was frustration building up with respect to China on the trade front for many years and most acutely during the second term of the Obama administration. So that, that would just be, you know, number one. In terms of, you know, what is it about that trading relationship, I think that there's just a fundamental view that there's not a level playing field 
between the United States and China when we're trying to trade and compete in the world um, in the, on the economic front. And for example, China um, does not adequately protect and enforce intellectual property, um, an area where you know, the United States is extremely competitive. It does not, um, it, it, it provides its, its companies um, financial assistance as well as subsidies, which allow it to, you know, really, really, um, it, it provides advantages that are not matched by private companies around the world. Right. Um, and that in particular, when it comes to technology, that China is focused on subsidizing the next generation of technologies. At the same time, it's forcing our companies to turn over their know-how, their source codes, their intellectual property, their trade secrets as a cost of doing business in China. And all of this, if you put it all together, this is unfair. This was never kind of contemplated. This wasn't the pact that we expected with China. And, if, and I think, um, you know, just a growing feeling that the current approaches in trying to work with China and trying to, you know, uh, trying to attack these practices and address them through the World Trade Organization, we're making some marginal improvements, but overall we're not fixing the situation. So a new approach was called for. Um, and that's where our president, I think, has, you know, been extremely vocal and focused on. And so just to be clear, Wendy Cutler, you have no issue with the fact that you felt some stronger measures or some standing up to China in this regard was appropriate. I, th that's correct. I mean, I agree that the time had come to really call China out um, and to, you know, try and, and find a new way to get them to play fairly. Okay. But I also think, and you'll tell me if, if we're right or not, that you're not a big fan of where this, in, in fairly rapid fire succession, we're now a couple of years into this, I guess, in the Trump administration, where this has gone, which is essentially what seems, again, to the layperson to be this almost never-ending cycle of the threat of a new tariff, a tariff, maybe we get some talks in Beijing or Washington, and then those talks collapse and we have more threats and we have more terror. I mean, we're in the middle of a cycle like that right now. Who knows where it will go? Um, are you concerned? Because tariffs, of course, are the ultimate, they're the antithesis of free trade. Um, what, what do you think about the tactics that have been used uh, to carry out the, um, the standing up to China? Well, to share a story with you, you know, I worked for nine U.S. trade representatives throughout my career, and a number of them through the years would ask us, well, why don't we just impose tariffs against this country if it's not playing by the rules? Different countries. Different countries, and it could have been China as well. And our response um, was basically twofold, was that, number one, we would break our obligations under the World Trade Organization which would then invite other countries to do the same, and that would work against our interest. And two, tariffs end up hurting the United States, whether it be our consumers, our workers, our farmers, or our businesses. And frankly, both of these um, concerns have really played out in real time. And so I do think, however, that it, maybe it was worth to go ahead with the first tranche of tariffs against China. It clearly got their attention. Right. It got China to the negotiating table. Um, but over time, I think the tariffs, which have been met in kind by China, haven't really, well, they have not brought us uh, you know, closer to a trade agreement. And I don't think they played out the way that the Trump administration expected. I think there was hope that once we started imposing tariffs, China would cave, hurt, be hurting economically, cave, and come to the negotiating table and make major concessions. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that the Chinese are not only responding by counter-retaliating, but their position seems to be hardening. And basically, they seem to be saying, we're not going to respond to these tactics. We're not going to cave. We have the wherewithal to, to get through this tit-for-tat tariff dispute. Right. And, and I believe on many occasions the president himself or others in the administration carrying out these policies have said, first of all, uh, it's not going to hurt Americans, at least not as much as it's going to hurt the Chinese. Uh, and ultimately, 
I don't know if this has been a spoken argument or just implicit, that uh, it's going to bring more jobs back to the United States, that, it, you know, the manufacturing, whatever. What's okay or not okay with those arguments? Yeah. Well, first, I, you know, let me, you know, I'll be the first to admit that the tariffs are hurting China. We've seen, you know, their manufacturing output going down. We've seen, you know, um, can, some plants being closed. We've seen economic growth declining um, over, you know, over previous quarters. But what we're also seeing is that the United States is suffering from these tariffs as well. And particularly as more and more products are hit by, by tariffs by the United States and, and China responds with counter retaliation, the hurt to the U.S. consumer, worker, farmer, and business are now becoming more and more acute. So, Wendy Cutler, as we said at the outset, you, you've been in the trenches of trade negotiations so many times, so many different countries. You said nine different uh, U.S. trade representatives. And I want to come back to a in the trenches with China question, but just to help our audience understand what being in the trenches can mean, and we said there's a lot of arcane issues, you explain, if you will, for our audience how it was that you were once immersed in conversations with the government of South Korea about the dental records of cows. I'm not making that up, am I? No, that's true. First, I'll just say before I get to, to the, your specific question, is that as a trade negotiator, you end up working on issues that you could never imagine. Because we have trade disputes with countries on issues ranging from insurance to semiconductors to telecommunications. It's not stuff you study beef. in college, right? It's I mean, not stuff you study in college. And Although there are similarities, believe it or not, between finding negotiated solutions in all of these areas, each sector has its unique um, attributes and peculiar peculiarities. And when it comes to beef, um, I will say that what I never knew is that we don't know in the U.S. the age of our cows. Okay, they don't have they don't walk or they don't have um, you know IDs which which include their birth date. Why this becomes relevant is that when the mad cow disease was found in the United States, uh. certain trade restrictions allowed trade to be restricted at a certain age. And so the foreign government wanted to know if they found a mad cow in the United States, what age was this cow? And since they don't have, they don't have birth certificates and they don't have you know, IDs with their age, basically the practice in the United States of determining their age is looking at their teeth. Uh -huh. And so as a result, when we would find a few mad cows through cows with mad cow disease through the years when this was an issue with, with um, South Korea, um, I needed to get the dental records from those dead cows oh, and send them to South Korea and try to convince them that we knew by looking at this photo that this cow was either over or under the magic age of 30 months. Um, so that's just kind of one example. But, you know, these issues are just repeated in, in case to case, sector to sector. And I think in one, in being a trade negotiator, you need to be very industrious and kind of figure out how you're going to overcome these types of problems. Because the Koreans were saying, we don't believe you. If you can't prove the age of this cow with a birth certificate, we don't believe you. And we would say, no, no, no. Look at their teeth. We know. And we would have experts kind of writing, you know, accompanying literature about how you could tell by this molar or that molar um, that the cow was of, of a certain age. Wow. The things we don't know. Yeah. Okay. So take us into the – there may not be anything quite so bizarre right now, but – uh, you've done a lot of negotiating with the Chinese. Obviously, you're very familiar with the issues at hand right now. What are some of the arcane things that, you know, your your former colleagues uh, and, of course, the Chinese, uh, your, the, the counterparts on the China side, what are they below the ministerial level, yeah. let's say? What, what kind of stuff are they probably going to be working on as, as talks resume? I mean, I mean, one issue that I think um, I could share with you is under these negotiations, China is saying that it's going to purchase more U.S. goods and more U.S. agricultural goods from the United States once this agreement, you know, is completed. And so that seems like you could, you could just write a sentence into an agreement that China agrees to buy more agriculture. Well, what does that mean and how do you enforce it? Hmm. And so what the negotiators need to do is to figure out which specific products, how much are they going to buy, 
um, they have to find the corresponding what we call um, codes in, in our tariff schedule to make sure we're talking about the exact same product. For example, for beef in our tariff schedule, there are probably 20 or 30 tariff lines, so we want to make right. sure we know exactly what type of beef we want them to buy. Um, and all of this has to be documented in a trade agreement. So when you hear the, 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 the document that they were negotiating was close to 150 pages, that probably shocks some people. It doesn't shock me because in order for these deals to be meaningful and enforceable, they need to be extremely detailed. And so trade negotiators need to know the details and to make sure they write the details down. And, you know, I've learned through my career that no matter how thorough you are, there's always a problem will come up. Um, and so there's always a need to kind of go back to the table and to make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're both on the same page with respect to these commitments. All-nighters about soybeans, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, just marrying the, the current conversation about the U.S. and China with this broader look at what's happened to the doctrine of free trade then, I mean, is there a, a way in which you can see, not to be too Pollyannish about it or naive maybe, but um, does the fate of the U.S.-China trade war, as we're calling it now, um, have the potential to really steer the world in a different direction? I mean, there's one scenario, right, where this just goes down the tubes and, and it's really, really protectionism writ large between the two largest economies on earth. Or if a deal gets done, might, you know, do you see a way in which people do start to see the benefits and, um, and maybe we're back to a place where free trade uh, as a policy and as a, as a proposition is, is suddenly comes into better regard. Uh, its reputation might be salvaged if things go well. Well, I don't think we're ever going to get back to where we were. I think we are in a new world, and I think we need to be more cognizant and responsive to concerns about trade that have been expressed, you know, by many constituencies in the United States. I think with respect to China, we're really at a juncture in these negotiations where it's uncertain where, where they're going to lead. If they lead to a deal, um, it's not going to be a perfect deal. Um, but um, I would expect we'll have a deal that would make sufficient progress to allow kind of both sides to lift the bulk of their tariffs at a minimum um, and maybe to get back to some new normal to be defined. But if there's not a deal and this tariff escalation continues and the United States goes through with all of the tariff increases it is pledged to do, meaning based virtually we have tariffs and high tariffs on all Chinese imports into the United States, I think that this is going to have wreak havoc on the whole international trading system and really challenge existing supply chains, leading companies to move their production to other places in the world or choose to stay in China with the consequences. But it's going to raise a lot of issues and questions for many countries around the world, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, um, but not limited um, to that region. Also, I think, well, you know, we're going to end up in a world in, in where, in particular, the new technologies and our ability to have kind of one system is going to be, you know, jeopardized. And we may just see a very bifurcated technology system with the kind of the U.S. kind of Western model on one hand, the China model on the other hand, and how that all works looking to the future is very unclear. So, yeah, I mean, stakes super high, obviously. But given everything you've said, Wendy Cutler, to, uh, to s summarize, and I'm going to pose a completely unfair question, but maybe you'll have at it anyway, which is um, whether it's on the U.S.-China front or the broader question we've been talking about, meaning the, the policy of free trade and, and its past and its future, if you had uh, the possibility of a few moments in the Oval Office sometime soon, let's say tomorrow you've got... I don't know, 15, 20 minutes with the president. H how would you make your case, given all the things you've thought about and been talking about uh, here, that, that uh, um, what, what would you say to him? The United States has a strong and innovative economy. In order for us to continue to grow and to create the kind of jobs that we need, we need to export, we need to be part of the international trading system. But at the same time, 
we need to address the concerns of those who are left behind, either through some social safety net policies, um, but also we need to, to educate the next generation of workers to make sure that they are ready and prepared for the new types of jobs that are going to be created by the new technologies um, that, are, that are now, you know, hitting the streets. Well, so you did that in about, I don't know, one minute, so you'd have 14 minutes left with him. 14. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy Cutler, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Tom. It's been my pleasure. That'll do it for this week's episode of Asia In Depth. You can check out our show page at asiasociety.org slash podcast and subscribe on iTunes. And please be sure to keep up with everything going on in Asia Society's universe by following us on Facebook and Twitter at Asia Society. In our next episode, Asia Society President and CEO Josette Sheeran speaks with one of Asia's most charismatic leaders, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan. Here's a sneak peek. Uh, I realized that it, you know, we, have, we had come across an ideology. You can't reason with this. You cannot reason with a racist ideology. Because the mere fact, and it's behind it is arrogance. Simple fact that you feel your race is superior to others is arrogance. And my worry is that it's arrogance that, that, may, uh, that may, uh, let you make miscalculations. And this is a miscalculation, this going into Kashmir, putting 8 million people in an open prison with 900,000 troops. I, a sane mind doesn't do this. I'm Matt Skiavenza. See you next Friday.